So we're talking about evolution, not acquisition. Uh, the, there's a little bit of evidence about evolution, very little. In fact, uh, to, to try to get evolutionary evidence about anything is extremely difficult. And of course, there's no direct evidence, naturally. So you have to reconstruct from very fragmentary evidence. Uh, in the case of uh, the, the cognitive capacities, like, like language, there's no direct evidence at all, of course. Nobody took tape recordings 100,000 years ago. Uh, so what you have to do is reconstruct. And the soft tissues of the brain don't fossilize. So all you know about the brain is the skull, uh, which tells you something, but not a lot. And then there are artifacts that uh, lead to some plausible speculations. So it's a very uh, weak, uh, weak inferences about uh, human evolution altogether, um, and it does not go as far as uh, answering the kind of question that, uh, that Michael just raised. So we really can't say maybe that happened, maybe not. Um, the Uh, Professor Chomsky, my question concerns your reversal of the Aristotelian maxim regarding sound and meaning. Um, the uh, Greeks would have, uh, and Aristotle himself, would have relied on the idea that idein is both thinking and speaking as a uh, chronologically uh, mo a chronological moment at the same time. Is there from cognitive neuroscience then a suggestion that there is uh, something that we can say that precedes the external expression uh, that is itself, however, discrete and language related, such that we can say that there is not the uh, occurrence at the same time, but rather a chronological occurrence of some sort of language, neural activity, and then we're making an expression of that. Well, the evidence doesn't really come from neuroscience. And it's a little bit like the question about evolution. Not enough is known about the brain. Uh, we do know a lot about, say, the human visual system, but that's uh, from experimentation with other animals. So invasive experimentation with, say, cats and monkeys uh, can teach you a lot about the detailed neurology of the visual system. Uh, in the case of uh, we and humans have approximately the same visual system, so one concludes that our system probably works the same way. Uh, but uh, in the case of language, you just can't do that. There are no other animals that have the capacities, so you can't uh, do comparative uh, neurology to try to imagine what uh, uh, the human language capacity is. Uh, so the evidence does not come from um, there is evidence from neuroscience, but it's mostly about localization. Uh, the evidence comes from uh, uh, what you can find out about the brain by uh, electrical activity and so on, and you can, or maybe uh, fMRI, as it's called, studies uh, the movement of the blood in the brain, that kind of thing. It gives you some information, but nothing about the detailed neurology. Uh, so uh, this, this very little neurological evidence. However, there's pretty strong evidence from language design, the way language works, uh, that it is essentially designed for thought, not for speech or some other form of uh, externalization. Externalization seems to be independent of modality. So sign works pretty much the same way speech does. Uh, theoretically, you can use other modalities. Uh, but, uh, uh, in fact, people can learn language from extremely limited uh, tactile evidence, like putting your hand on the face and so on. A deaf blind can learn a language that way very well. In fact, uh, Helen Keller is a famous case. Uh, the, uh, there's no experimentation with it. Uh, so, so it seems to be modality independent. Uh, there is design evidence from the nature of language. It's a little bit like what I mentioned the other day. I just barely touched on it. 
But if you look closely at the nature of language, the nature of the computational procedures, it turns out that they directly yield structures that are interpretable for thought, but then they're modified in the process of externalization uh, so that uh, they actually lead to uh, communication problems, again, because of minimization operations. Uh, so it looks very much as if language is a thought system, and then externalization would come along later. Actually, there's pretty good read on this good, like, as I mentioned, you can't, you don't learn a lot from about evolution, but there's some reasonable speculations. Uh, one, uh, which is in fact uh, accepted by some leading evolutionary biologists, uh, Nobel laureates and so on, is that uh, uh, if you think about what must have happened at some point, uh, as was just pointed out, at some point in the evolutionary record, uh, hu some humans must have our remote ancestors that must have acquired a capacity which animals lack uh, to construct uh, some operation that yields an infinite array of uh, structured expressions. I mean, all well, humans have that capacity. Uh, you go back, uh, say, 100,000 years, there's no evidence that uh, the capacity existed anywhere. So somewhere in that, and as I think I mentioned the other day, uh, in the last roughly 50,000 years, there has been no evolution to speak of. All humans are essentially identical in this capacity, uh, which means that somewhere in a pretty narrow window, this computational operation appeared. Well, that's presumably some slight rewiring of the brain, but uh, the result of some mutation, no other mechanism known. But a mutation takes place in an individual, not in a group. Okay, that's uh, obvious. So that means that some person, you know, say, call them, whatever you want to call them, say Eve, uh, uh, found that something happened to her. Just like genetic mutation, she ended up having this capacity. Well, Eve then had the capacity to think. She could construct uh, arbitrarily complex expressions in her mind. She could relate them to the thought system. Uh, she could plan, interpret, uh, do all sorts of things that uh, the other people in her tribe couldn't do. And these people were living in small groups, hunter-gatherer groups, maybe in maximum, maybe a couple hundred people, probably less. Uh, but she was alone. She was the one person who could think. Uh, that alone tells us that language probably was designed for thought, not speech. Well, presumably this capacity to think uh, provided some sort of selectional advantage. And she was a little better off than other people. Uh, the ability would have partially been transmitted to offspring. Uh, they would have been slightly better off than anyone else. Uh, pretty soon you have a group of people in the tribe who are a little, have some advantage that others don't have. Well, a small selectional advantage can uh, spread, it can lead to more reproduction, essentially. That's what, what it means. Uh, it's not a simple matter. It has been shown that uh, selectional advantages do not uh, very rarely translate into uh, ex extension of the selectional advantage. It obviously sometimes happens. That we're not all bacteria. So it sometimes happens, but pretty rarely. Uh, no, so as far as we know, this might have happened any number of times in, uh, the, in human history, but they never survived. Well, once we know it survived, because we're here and we all have the capacity. So somehow it uh, survived. Pretty soon the, the hunter-gatherer group had a lot of people and it had this capacity. At, at that point, it, it might have occurred to some smart guy that it would be useful to externalize it. Uh, then you could figure out what somebody else was thinking. So modes of externalization were developed, uh, many different ones. I mean, there's many different ways to externalize what's inside uh, so it comes out of uh, the mouth, uh, the hands, uh, whatever was used to communicate. And in fact, uh, 
there are many different ways of externalizing. We see it uh, right in front of us. What we call a lot of different languages are probably just different ways of externalizing. I mean, it could turn out, you can't prove this yet, but it could turn out that the uh, variety of languages reduces the variety of externalization. I mean, experience tends to conform to that. So, for example, if one of you decides to learn a second language, you know, what you're going to study is the externalization. You cannot study the uh, fundamental, the core uh, principles. For one reason, you can't study them because nobody knows them, so nobody can teach them to you. But now something is known about them, but it's part problem. It's kind of like the learning to see. You don't learn to see by figuring out, by being taught how the visual system works, of course. Uh, so when you're learning a language, you think about it. You learn the sound system, you learn the morphology, the inflections, the irregular verbs, you learn a couple of things about order, you know, so the German has a slightly different word order than English and so on. Uh, those are all very superficial things. Yeah, but that's where the complexity of language is. And that's essentially all that you learn. You can't learn. You learn some very superficial things about meaning, very superficial. Which word, which meaning goes with which sound. But that's true. Uh, and it's learned very fast. I mean, it's known from experimental evidence that children pick up the meaning of words, you very young children, a year or two old, uh, extremely quickly. They may learn, a child may learn you know, eight or ten words a day, which means they're basically learning them on one exposure. Uh, and somehow they already know the rich, complex meaning that's inside somewhere, uh, and they just attach it to some sound. Uh, as far as the syntax and the rules of form of semantics go, there's no way of learning. And they've just got to be in there and somehow used when enough uh, stimulation occurs, like other uh, innate capacities. Well, this, all of this suggests that uh, the uh, variety and complexity of language is actually in a secondary system, in the externalization system. And what you would expect is that the core nature of language would just uh, come about by uh, basically laws of nature. That's what I meant the other day by saying it could turn out it's kind of like a snowflake. It's just developed by laws of nature, laws of computational complexity and so on. Uh, anyhow, that's the kind of evidence. I mean, I don't want to overstate that none of this is proven. There's just sort of evidence in this direction which would indicate that the Aristotelian dictum should be reversed. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Professor Chomsky, uh, uh, you already mentioned uh, language acquisition. I'm interested in um, something, how you are... Um, um, how you now consider language acquisition in the new framework of the minimalist program. Because uh, before, in the principle and parameter theory, it was clear that you said, um, okay, there's some principles, and um, when a child acquires a language, then it uh, has to acquire the parameters. Uh, but now, in the, in the minimalist program, the principles are if I've got that right, are abolished and they are, are replaced by the operations merge and move. Uh, what impact has this on language acquisition, or how do you see language acquisition now in this new framework? Well, um, the, the, maybe the phrase minimalist program should never have been used. It's misled people. I mean, I've tried to explain it many times, but actually there's a principle about language and that is, if anything can be misunderstood, it will be misunderstood. <laughs> that works uh, like almost 100% uh, it's for the human sciences generally. But uh, the minimalist program is just an extension of what's been done since the beginning. It's a little different because uh, research reached the point where it seemed that you could try a new research paradigm. It's just a different way of doing research with the same program, essentially. The different way of doing research was to, uh, what's suggested is, we might ask, uh, what would be a perfect system? 
and then ask how look at the discrepancy between that and what we actually appear to see and then proceed to see if you can overcome the discrepancy. Well, that's a research program. It's not a thesis. And it's been a pretty productive one. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, principles and parameters are concerned, that's essentially the same. Uh, so the, the, this approach would sharply simplify the principles and maybe it would somehow simplify the parameters. What it would suggest this comes out of what I was saying before, and it's like 30 years of work trying to show this, that uh, the, the parameters are in the externalization. I mean, it could, it could turn out, can't prove it again, but it could turn out that in the core syntactic semantic system, the basis of language design, there's no variation at all. Uh, that's a pretty plausible expectation because of the rapidity with which it's acquired and the impossibility of teaching any of it. And that would go down to things like the meaning of words and so on and so forth. So it could be that it will turn out that the core of language has no parametric variation and that the parametric choices have to do with uh, various aspects of externalization. So sound system, morphology, inflection, uh, irregular verbs. Uh, and notice that the externalization is very susceptible to external influences. So say the, the Norman invasion in, of England changed the language radically. It became sort of half French-like. Uh, and in fact, it, a teenage jargon is a typical way in which languages change, uh, and very quickly, in fact. Uh, and uh, it's, it is very susceptible to influence. I mean, uh, like my children, for example, that don't speak the way I do. They speak the way their friends do. You know? The children tend to pick up the language of their peers, not the language of their parents, for whatever reason. Uh, so you get pretty, uh, pretty good reasons. But uh, they, uh, sometimes parents aren't too happy about the reasons. But uh, the, uh, it, it, it's pretty well known. So it, it could turn out, that's it, your point is quite correct, it could turn out that the parameters really are in the externalization system. Uh, but you have to find them. And there's been there's a lot of difficulty in finding them. In fact, the inquiry into parameters has tended to show that they fall into two quite different types. Uh, there are sometimes called macro parameters, micro parameters. So the macro parameters are big effects, like uh, uh, is it a head initial language or a head final language? It seems to have a big effect. Uh, is it a polysynthetic language or analytic language? And on the other hand, there are various, if, if you study the people who study dialects in detail, people like, say, Richard Kane and others, uh, Rita Manzini, uh, they find tiny differences between very closely related what we call dialects, actually languages. And uh, these seem to vary all over the place. So nobody knows how many of them there are. I mean, but, uh, uh, but they seem to be of a different character than the macro parameters. So probably the, you can guess reasonably that the research into parameters may divide up this way. And then, of course, the question arises whether the macro parameters are part of the externalization or part of the core system. And there's a, an interesting debate about this. So e even the question of, say, linear order, which I mentioned, which would have to do with uh, ordering parameters, I, I suggested the other day that it's all externalization, but there's very good links to, like Richard Kane, for example, who argue the opposite and have good evidence. So it's a it's a it's a science, not a religion. You know, there's conflicts all all along the way. I try to resolve. Uh, you are, you are emphasized that language is a thought system. Yes. You emphasized, you said that language is a thought system. Seems to be. Yes. Would you go so far and say that language is the very reason that human specific thinking is possible? I can't think of a coherent alternative. 
Now, there's a lot of literature, uh, books coming out all the time, articles uh, uh, claiming that there was, that uh, language is a kind of a secondary phenomenon. Thought came first. But nobody has ever given a proposal as to what thought can be other than a language. Uh, what else is thought? I mean, how do you, you know, express, a, how do you think a subject predicate relation unless you have a language like system? Uh, and uh, how do you uh, think, uh, you know, an operator variable construction unless you have a language like system? So when you eliminate that kind of hand waving and vacuous talk, uh, the claim that thought preceded language is just the claim that language preceded externalization. So it comes back to the same thing. If you think of language as just being externalization, well, yeah, it's probably true that thought preceded language, but the thought itself is the language. It's the real language. Uh, there's no alternative that I know of and or you can imagine to uh, the idea that thought is basically a language-like system. Now that doesn't mean that all thought is in language, of course it isn't, but the kind of thought that can be expressed in language seems to be language-like. Mr. Chomsky, from your personal point of view, what is the most powerful way to change the world and to contribute to more peace without... Yeah, sorry, we have said that we first... No. Please. Linguist, yeah, but we make to say first the linguistic. Oh, sorry, I missed that point. I'm yeah. very sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we'll come to it. Yeah, we come to it. Unless... It wasn't on purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the second half of the story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And der andere ist, äh, der, der, der erste gewesen, dann sie, dann sie, dann sie. Yes, but uh, actually my questions, my question aims to establish a, a bound between uh, the presentation uh, you made uh, the past two days. Uh, and it is, um, you were talking yesterday uh, about some uh, global democratic process. Uh, what? Yes, yes, no, 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 yesterday you were talking about a, a global democratic process that are taking place nowadays. Now, my, my question is, um, uh, how uh, could we see a language, yes, and the possibilities of language, scientifically speaking, uh, and its uh, importance for a global uh, processes of social and political transformation? Language itself is kind of irrelevant to this. So uh, in a more democratic society, you speak the same language you do in a totalitarian society. So it takes a modern Germany, which had very radical shifts up and back more than any other modern society. So the 1920s, you know, maybe the peak of Western democracy, uh, 1930s, uh, the depths, uh, today the peak again. But the language didn't change. People spoke the same language. Uh, the way they used the language might have changed. In fact, did change. But that's that's use of language. It's not the instrument itself. And it's kind of like uh, you know, the language is kind of like a tool. Let's say like a hammer. Uh, a hammer doesn't care whether it's used to build a house or to torture a prisoner. As far as the hammer is concerned, it's irrelevant. Uh, uh, and uh, it can be used for anything. And uh, I think the same is true of language. I mean, there are some slight changes, so, but they're mostly changes in usage. So propaganda, for example, modifies the, uh, the use of language, the, makes up new meanings for words, for example. Uh, but these are really pretty superficial things. The language is overwhelmingly the same, no matter how it's used. So I don't really think there's a connection. Um, some of my colleagues disagree, incidentally, so this is my view. Professor Chomsky, do we have a reasonable notion about that? I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> do we have a reasonable notion about the relation between the lexicon and the computational system in the beginning, in the Adamite? 
um, period and its, its, its emergence later and the different weights that the lexicon versus the computational system had in when growing up to our state of the language faculty. And you're essentially talking about evolution again. Well, we're back in the same morass. We don't know anything about evolution. Uh, the uh, it's 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 hard to uh, it, it, you, know, you can imagine almost any story. Now let's take Eve again. This person who had the good or bad fortune, depending on how you look at it, to have this uh, capacity to think. She uh, there had to be some kind of units around. You can't have a computational system without some kind of atoms of computation. And so she essentially something more or less word-like, maybe not words, but uh, something more or less word-like had to be around. But how much did there have to be? Well, we can't say. And the richness of meanings of words, it could have all been there in the concepts, whatever concepts she had. In fact, almost, again, hard to think of an alternative. However, with the growth of the, the, the appearance of the capacity to produce complex constructions, it's very likely that that led to lexical enrichment in some fashion, again, using some sort of uh, innate capacities. So uh, at this point, you can, you can produce stories, and all kinds of them, but no evidence for any of them. So I don't think there's an answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, regarding your two-step hypothesis, um, do you, would you would it make sense to ask uh, if there's an innate grammar also to that externalization process, the secondary process, or only to is there um, is there is this not innate at all, and we only have to consider the notion of innate grammar or the innate construction um, regarding that constructive first step, possibly silent, um, thought-related process when a language emerged. And the second question is, um, what do you think about the hypothesis? I think it's by jo Josef Reichholz, the Munich biologist, that multiple languages occur specifically as a, uh, as a consequence that groups would want not others to understand them, that specifically to bar the understanding of others when um, groups would compete for resources, for example. And, well, um, yeah. um, the, the, the second part to the first question, I forgot, do we have a written aid grammar for music, listening music, for example? Yeah. Uh, well, um, okay, that's several questions. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I mean, first of all, everything that we do is based on something innate. The same with everything that an animal does. Uh, so there's always some innate element. I mean, the, the word innate is a kind of a bad word in some circles, but that's just confusion. I mean, no animal, down to bacteria, just uh, acts randomly in all possible ways. So they're somehow constrained. And that's innate structure. And of course, it's true of every aspect of humans. But the purpose of the question was not innate, but grammar. Would you consider it as grammar itself? Grammar. Well, the initial, I mean, if the uh, scenario that I described is anywhere near accurate, then the initial stage was totally innate. It was a, uh, a wiring, neural wiring change, or mutation which led to something new, and out of that comes some cognitive system, and there's no other factors entering into how it comes. So that's totally innate. Uh, then comes the question, what happened next? Is it affected by uh, uh, further experience, by other genetic changes? Could have been many other genetic changes. They'd still be innate, but they could be different, and so on. And there we're entering into the world of complete speculation. There's no evidence. Uh, the uh, variety of languages plainly involves experience, like 
I don't speak Swahili, okay? If I had grown up in Kenya, I would. But uh, so plainly, there's no question that the experience has an effect. And now we're back to the question that was raised before. Uh, does it have an effect only on the externalization? Or to what extent does it affect uh, the core grammar and semantics, including meaning of words? Well, uh, there's, a, I think, a reasonable speculation that it's externalization, but not certain by any means. Uh, but even in the externalization, I mean, the, let's say the pronunciation, the morphology, uh, order, word order, every, everything in the externalization, now there have to be innate factors. I mean, otherwise, in, otherwise it's incoherent. You can't acquire anything except in terms of some restricted capacities that you have. I mean, that's as old as Aristotle. And it's plainly true, it's close to logically true, that uh, you've got to have some kind of pre existing structure in order to acquire anything. So there are always going to be innate elements, and the question is uh, what kind are there? Are there innate elements specific to language, uh, or, or are there the innate elements that enter into other forms of cognitive development? Uh, uh, the elements that enter into statistical analysis and so on and so forth. And that's, these are just research problems. And there's a little bit of evidence about them, but not a lot known. I mentioned, I think I mentioned some the other day about uh, detecting words, a child detecting word-like elements from running text. So plenty of pretty early development. And it appears that it's done by a mixture of statistical analysis and uh, grammatical principles about prosody and so on. Well, there's a few cases like that that are understood, and there may be more. Uh, but uh, it can't be that there's no innate element. That's impossible for any kind of growth, cognitive or other. Uh, the, uh, the, the question. Second question. What is the language of expression and how um, uh, uh, man developed different languages? So how do you develop different languages? Yeah, the idea that uh, one of the ways, of the motives for developing different languages, probably meaning different kinds of externalization, is uh, preserving group identity and uh, separation from other groups. That's conceivable. It's been suggested a number of times. There's, uh, uh, there's an important book by... Uh, a generative grammarian, a very good one, Mark Baker, uh, called Atoms of Language, in which in the last chapter he uh, he's studying for my, macro parameters, called micro parameters before, like polysynthesis and so on. And at the end of the book, he has a chapter, I think, it, I don't know if it's tongue in cheek or not, but uh, he suggests that uh, maybe different macro parameters were chosen uh, in order to deceive others. So he, he uses it as an example. Uh, during the Second World War, uh, the U.S. intelligence uh, used Navajo speakers to communicate so that the Germans wouldn't understand them, uh, the coding technique. And he suggests that uh, maybe this developed kind of the way you, suggest, you mentioned. Well, that's possible. Uh, again, we have the slightest idea. Uh, there's no evidence for it, but it's a possibility. And uh, the, the last question is about music. Uh, here there are some interesting questions. They go back to the origins of evolutionary theory. So you go back to Darwin and uh, especially Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-inventor of, co-discoverer of natural selection. Uh, Wallace wrote uh, more than Darwin about questions like this. I don't think he mentioned music, but he was interested in the fact that all human beings uh, have uh, arithmetical capacity. How come all human, that's another universal human capacity, unique to humans, uh, we can deal with numbers, uh, natural numbers, uh, you know, one, two, three, but integers, they can multiply, you know, calculate, and so on. So where'd that come from? And he pointed out that that's a kind of a mystery because in, in human history, that capacity was 
virtually never used. It's only quite recently, in the last couple of thousand years, that there's any evidence the capacity was used at all. And even then, it's only used by a very small number of people. Uh, by now, a lot of people, but until very recently, almost none. Uh, so it couldn't have been selected. So uh, how did it get there? Well, he believed, Wallace believed, and here he had a big argument with Darwin, his colleague, his Angeline. Uh, Wallace believed he had to have some other principle besides natural selection to account for the emergence of this capacity. Uh, I think we can now see that that's not the case, that uh, very likely the numerical capacity just piggybacked on language. It, if you take a look at the core computational principles of language and you simplify them very narrowly, uh, you reduce the lexicon to one element and let the principle of computation function freely, you essentially get the natural numbers. And so it could have just been a uh, what's called an acceptation, you know, taking some uh, character, characteristic that's already there and using it for some other purpose. Uh, the questions about it, as always, but that's, uh, that's, that's a strong possibility. Well, what about music? Uh, music and uh, dance seem to be universal. I don't think any society has been found that doesn't have something like music. It could be based on different principles, like uh, Western music is uh, tonal, uh, other kinds of music are rhythmic, or, but there seems to be, it seems to be uh, universal for humans. So we get the same question, uh, where did it come from? And uh, again, one possibility is that, at least in part, it's, uh, it, it's uh, building on language. Now, there are structures in music that uh, are language-like, and well, they've been investigated uh, you know, 30 years ago, I guess. Uh, Leonard Bernstein, famous musician, uh, gave a series of lectures at Harvard uh, based on this theme, trying to show that uh, he, he kept to uh, Western, the Western canon, you know, tonal-based music, and uh, tried to show that its structure and character uh, it could have been derived from language. Since then, there's a lot of work on the topic, uh, pro and con. So that's a possibility. Uh, and if that's not the core, then you got to search for some other source. Uh, it does appear to be a, a, a genetic human capacity. It's uh, unknown among other organisms. Uh, I mean, it, you, you do get things a little like it, mainly in songbirds. The songbirds do have something superficially it looks a little bit like music and it's, uh, but it's, it's very different in character actually there's quite good work on this by uh, uh, his name is uh, 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 a scientist I think at Utrecht who's worked on it uh, to dig up the name but uh, so, so they're different you know but nevertheless some of them rough similarities uh, but you know songbird evolutionarily uh, extremely remote from humans. It's, if anything, it's some kind of convergence. It's not, not an evolutionary source. Uh, and so we're up in the air, as with most questions about evolution. I think I may have mentioned uh, the other day that very simple questions of evolution are understood to be so complex that nobody even looks at them. Like the evolution of communication system of bees. Uh, there's about 500 species of bees uh, some of them have quite complex communication systems. Uh, some Frisch's studies sort of broke this open. Uh, some of them have no communication system at all that anybody can detect. Uh, and, and they make out of that as well as the ones that have, uh, you know, waggle dance and so on. So it raises the question of what it's all for. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're different, lots of different systems. So you get a lot of comparative evidence. Uh, bees, of course, uh, uh, tiny organisms. I think the, uh, the brain is about the size of a grass seed. Uh, so you can do much, I mean, it's much easier to study than complex mammals. Uh, you can do any kind of experiment you like. You know, the bees don't have to sign 
electrons and forms and so on. So uh, that anything, all kinds of experimentation are possible. They have very short gestation periods, I think a couple of days, so you can breed them. You, essentially everything's open, but uh, nothing's known. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard problem. And science isn't easy. Uh, and studying something which looks as simple as evolution of bee communication is so difficult that there's almost nothing in the literature about it. And not that people haven't thought about it, they just understand you can't do much. Uh, when you get to, it's a kind of a paradox that uh, there are libraries full of books on uh, evolution of langu- human language, which is an incomparably more difficult question. And almost nothing on the evolution of bee language. It's a kind of a pathology of uh, human culture that people can't see that uh, they're trying to study something that's way out of sight when you can't even study much simpler cases. You uh, can ask why that goes on, but it certainly does. You go to the library, you can check it out pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, yeah, the questions you raise are, are certainly significant ones. Like, where does music come from? Why does it have the few forms that it does? Uh, how come uh, t- humans can pick up children can pick up a musical style so simply actually there's pretty remarkable evidence on this you may some of you may know uh, the study of uh, a girl who was called Jeannie G-E-N-I-E they called her she was uh, this is a, a girl who's uh, who was put into a who was locked into a room when she was about I think about two years old, raised parents. And she was kept in almost in total isolation. She was found when she was about 12, and of course released and treated and so on. But she went from two to 12, roughly that, uh, without any human contact. Uh, Nobody spoke to her. Uh, uh, Her father uh, pushed food under the door, and she could. Pick it up. I think she was tied to a chair, in fact. But, uh, but uh, it, when they finally kind of found her and tried to you know, save her somehow, uh, it turned out she was very smart. She could figure things out. She learned very quickly and learned pretty complicated things. And she was also apparently very personable, so everybody liked her. And, so on. and the experimenters at first fooled themselves into thinking that she was acquiring language she was able to act in ways which made it look like she was acquiring language, but closer investigation showed she really didn't. However, she she did know musical styles. She was probably hearing something, you know, through the window or somewhere, uh, very, but uh, it turned out that she she obviously was psychologically, you know, a total mess, but the uh, psychologist who was taking care of her, a very good person, very good, Susan Curtis, who happened to be a pianist, and she uh, discovered that she could calm Jeannie down if she was upset by playing certain styles of music, specific styles, I think Romanian folk songs or something. She she obviously identified those styles, and they meant something to her. So with almost minimal experience, she had acquired an understanding of musical genres. Fortunately, there's not a lot of cases like this, but uh, where it really exists, it turns out that musical styles apparently can be acquired extremely fast, kind of like language. Uh, That must mean that, well, we would anticipate in advance anyhow that there's very sharp uh, genetic restrictions which come from somewhere. Where is an open question. Uh, Professor Chomsky, you pointed out that thought is a language-based system, and uh, but you always uh, also said that it never can be proved; it only can be uh, some hin- some hints on it. And did you ever think about what might be a refutation for that assumption? Well, a refutation would first of all have to be some alternative hypothesis. And at the moment, there's no alternative hypothesis. Now, you can only uh, investigate the 
correctness of some hypothesis if there's an alternative to compare it with. And I don't know of any. I would like um, now to allow a question from the All Are C. Are there questions in All Are C? Mm, yes. Thank you. I cannot listen. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I would like to come back to um, the attempt to interconnect, first of all, yeah, linguistics are talking about uh, at the moment and yeah, political questions and I do not agree or I have another estimation that um, that uh, linguistics or language has an important impact on the way human beings behave and also yeah, on social relations. So my question would be, um, you just mentioned that structures in music um, are also based on language but are the structures in human relations also based on language, or languages, and the way language is expressed? Well, the, the human relations are certainly based on the way language is expressed. I mean, that's not even controversial. But the scientific question is a different one. Is the way in which language use influences thought does that reflect differences in the characteristics of the language itself? Or is it kind of like a hammer? You can, like I said, torturer can use it, a carpenter can use it. So is language like that? Uh, 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 or is it somehow the structure and nature of language that influences human uh, behavior? As far as I know, there's no evidence that it does, and there's pretty strong evidence that it doesn't. Uh, the history of Germany, which I mentioned, is a pretty good example. The German, the language German, didn't change in any relevant way from the 1920s to today, but the uh, human behavior certainly changed radically. In fact, about as radical as anything in modern history. And uh, there's many other examples like that. So, if somebody, it's a very common view, even among science, uh, linguists and anthropologists, particularly sociologists, what you expressed, but it's extremely hard to think of any evidence for it. Though, of course, language use, transparently, uh, relates in all sorts of ways to, so, to human relations. Is eine andere Frage zum Bereich, uh, hallo? Ja? Bitte. Ja, fangen Sie an. Is this working? Ja. Es wird bis rein bis gehen. Uh, I have two quick questions about uh, linguistics, one more fair. general, uh, one more general and the other one a bit more technical. Um, the general question is, uh, so in, in linguistics you easily get the impression that uh, everything is still up for grabs and things come and go. Uh, what do you think are the main insights that uh, generative grammar uh, has revealed uh, so far in the past 50 years? Um, so uh, what I have in mind are things like you know, you know, theory of case and things like that. So what do you think are the main uh, technical uh, insights that the program has, has brought up so far? And the second, a uh, bit more uh, technical question is, uh, you mentioned in your uh, lecture uh, the case of illicit extractions, uh, alleged extractions or, or whatever. Um, what you said was that uh, in all these cases we have the intuition or the impression that these illicit sentences expressed is still a coherent thought. And uh, your conclusion was that that indicates that there's something about externalization uh, again involved here. And uh, as you know, in research on ellipsis and so on suggests the same thing, that uh, externalization plays a role uh, there. And uh, I, would, I would just like to know if you have any thoughts uh, about why that might be. That is, why might the externalization system care about Things like islands. Well, uh, first of all, this um, uh, the first question is a good question, but it would require a complex answer. In fact, just the answer would be given by comparing what was thought about language, say, in the 
1950s with what's thought about language today, it's very different. So go back to the 1950s, it was the, the earliest steps in trying to construct generative grammar, actually the late 40s, uh, had uh, phrase structure grammars, uh, transformational grammars, uh, both very complex, a lot, a lot of intricacy uh, that seemed to be necessary to just yield minimal descriptive adequacy. Uh, all of that, almost all of that has been eliminated. So phrase structure grammar, which is an extremely complex system with lots of stipulations, now that's been, in modern generative grammar, that's been uh, eliminated totally, no residue of it. Uh, transformational grammars were, had pretty complex structures in the 1950s. Uh, later on, as you know very well, they were reduced to, there were successful reductions to much simpler principles, like ultimately, say, move, move anything anywhere. Uh, a major discovery of the late 90s uh, is uh, that the two, what's left of the two systems can be combined under a single operation, which furthermore is the simplest possible computational operation that's merged. It was recognized, should have been recognized much earlier, but it wasn't. The merge alone gives you the rudiments of both systems uh, and does it in a fashion which uh, is adapted to thought systems, but maladapted to speech systems, which is part of the reason for thinking that uh, there is this dichotomy that I mentioned. Uh, the uh, shift from the, the early approaches, 50s and 60s, the conception of universal grammar was that it provided a format for grammars. So just here's the kind of system a grammar is, but it permitted an infinite number of them. Okay, therefore, it had to be supplemented by some procedure, it's called an evaluation procedure, which would pick one or another uh, given data. You have to count for language acquisition. So the, the idea was the child is just approaching language acquisition with the uh, understanding that this is the format that the language has to satisfy, but there are an infinite number of possibilities, and therefore you use some procedure to select among them. Well, that's the general problem that's called abduction in the philosophy of science. It uh, goes back to Charles Sanders' purse, and it's known to be unsolvable. Uh, so uh, scientists somehow do it, but by a mysterious process that nobody understands. Uh, but the child has to have a way of doing it. Uh, and what's the way? Well, that was a, a real difficulty. But that difficulty was resolved by kind of cutting the Gordian knot, and that's the Principles and Parameters program around 1980, that, uh, which allows only a finite number of choices. So from that point of view, the acquisition process is kind of like asking, answering a questionnaire. Here's a finite number of questions, child has to answer each one of them. When each one's answered, you get the language. Well, that's a, that's a huge change. Then comes a very rich period of uh, extensive research. I think there's no doubt that more has been learned about language since around 1980 than in the entire several thousand years of history of linguistic research. It was a very uh, productive research program. It does have all kind of problems like the ones I mentioned. Uh, well, all of the, the takes a case, the, the, which you mentioned, uh, it's kind of striking that in all of the history of study of language, there was never really any recognition. Uh, it was implicit understanding, but never explicit recognition of, the, of what is a pretty simple fact, that namely that there's a difference between inherent case and structural case. The inherent case is you know, like uh, ablative in Latin has a particular meaning. The structural cases like is nominative and accusative or ergative and absolutive, which uh, have no meaning at all. Uh, they just depend on the structural position. Uh, it's a pretty sharp difference. But if you take really classic studies like uh, Roman Jakobson's uh, Kazuslera, one of the major achievements of structural linguistics, he doesn't make any distinction. 
he tries to find a meaning for nominative case and accusative case. Didn't mention it. He would have tried for ergative and absolutive. And that's just false. Well, that distinction was really recognized uh, in the 70s by Jean-Jacques Bernier, uh, actually in a famous letter, which uh, is now well known, in which he made the distinction and drew many consequences from it. Well, that, uh, uh, in part, what he was arguing was that every language has the same case system in the internal language. It's externalized differently. So in, say, Latin and English, you externalize it very differently than English, barely, practically, not at all, Chinese, nothing. But it's the same internally, and he argued that the consequences of, that the uh, uh, structural case system in particular has certain consequences, and those consequences are found even if you don't articulate it. It's a little bit like a WH movement, uh, you know, say in Chinese, you don't see it, but it seems to have the same consequences. Uh, the, uh, well, that's Vernio's case theory around 1980. It became pretty well known. And since then, there's a ton of inquiry into it. You know, just how does it work? Is it a plausible theory? Can you sustain it uh, in the face of apparent counterexamples? Uh, you know, Finnish, Icelandic, uh, look quite different. Can you work it into the same system and so on? Uh, so that's a rich area. But all of this is quite considerable progress. I mean, nobody, in their right minds anyway, teaches the study of language the way you did in the 1950s, or the 60s, or for that matter, the 80s. Well, all of that is progress. Uh, inherent in the core computational system. So take, say, locality. Uh, there's been a lot of investigation of locality. So, for example, uh, uh, Luigi Rizzi's uh, relativized minimality, or it's the core notion in contemporary generative grammar. That could well be uh, what I was calling a third factor principle, just a principle of natural law, a principle of minimal computation. I mean, the, a, a fair assumption, and by now reasonably well supported, is that since language is a computational system, it's going to satisfy the general properties of computational systems, one of which will be minimal computation. Do as little computation as you can. Okay, and in fact, if you have locality principles, it does reduce the computation extensively. So it's quite possible that uh, locality principles are just uh, just come from the fact that uh, the language is a natural a system of the natural world. Uh, that's a possibility, and I think it's probably true. It probably has nothing to do with externalization. Uh, on the other hand, there are uh, there are cases where you get constraints in perf- uh, properties of performance that uh, this is the other extreme properties of performance that uh, do involve other systems, other systems like memory. Okay, so for example, about uh, 50 years ago, uh, George Miller, a psychologist, and I uh, did some studies of uh, uh, perform- embed- performance embedding. Uh, if you have embedded structures, like uh, structures like if-then constructions, or either or, or the men are, but not the men is, things where there are long-distance dependencies, which can be embedded inside each other, and you can get indefinite uh, constructive uh, uh, bounding. Well, it turns out that Humans can't process these when they go beyond about seven. You can push it hard. If you push it hard, you can construct a sentence of about seven levels of embedding, which are reasonably intelligible. Well, there's a reason why, and it comes out of George Miller's work on short-term memory. This famous paper of his in the 1950s called The Magic Number Seven Plus or Minus Two. Uh, and uh, the discovery was that uh, apparently uh, uh, across you know, a wide range of animals, including humans, uh, short-term memory has about seven options uh, for uh, birds, maybe five, you know, some other organisms six, but somewhere in that range, maybe 
some humans can maybe go up to eight or something, but uh, there is a short-term memory limitation, and that would account for the performance, uh, this aspect of performance. Well, that's a, a restriction. It's not so much on, on externalization, if you like, but it's coming from something else. It's coming from the structure of memory. Now, there's another discovery, which is much more interesting. We also have it in the same paper. And that is, if you have self-embedding, that is, you put a, you have an agreement relation, like a plural noun, a plural verb. If you have an agreement relation, you embed it in another agreement relation. Or you have a if-then construction, you put it inside another if-then construction. Uh, Then the bound on performance reduces sharply. In fact, you can barely get to three, three. Uh, people just can't understand it. Uh, when you get to two, you can manage, but three is almost impossible. You have to really think about it or write it down or something like that. So for self-embedding, there's a much narrower restriction. Now, that can't come from short-term memory because it's the same short-term memory consideration. So there's got to be some other reason for that. And we suggest it's still a research question, but one thing we suggested is that uh, in processing a sentence, it's, it's sort of like a, you work in kind of like a computer program. Uh, at each point, you're calling in a subroutine. So there's a kind of subroutine saying, okay, I'm now in an agreement problem or I'm now in an if then problem. And it could turn out that when you're executing a subroutine, you can't call on the same subroutine. Okay, if that's the case, you would get uh, self-embedding maybe up to level two. So it could be the answer, but, but, but it could be some other answer. Now, but those are cases where uh, other factors enter into performance, which are not part of the linguistic system. Well, uh, what about uh, islands of the kind I mentioned uh, the other day, ECP? You know, you know, how many mechanics do you wonder if fix the cars? Now, it turns out that if you look at other languages, uh, say Italian, you have sentences just like that. Well, this looked like a problem about 30 years ago, and uh, we now have the standard separation of linguistics from the natural sciences, unfortunately. As I mentioned the other day, uh, in the natural sciences, typically when you get something that looks like contradiction of a principle, you don't throw away the principles. You try to find the reasons for the apparent difference. Uh, classic example, which I mentioned, is the uh, perturbations in the uh, in the orbits of, in the orbit of Uranus. Uh, that was noticed, actually, I think, or maybe as back, far back as Galileo, but it was noticed. But uh, the scientists didn't throw out Kepler's laws and Newton's laws what they did was search for some reason for the perturbation. And sooner or later they found Neptune. The same problem arose with Neptune and found Pluto. Uh, But uh, in in the study of language, uh, there's kind of like a drive to throw out everything. So if you find something that doesn't work, you say, okay, let's throw out everything. Now that goes on all the time. A lot of contemporary papers about it. It's totally irrational. But it's a driving force in the human sciences, uh, unfortunately. Well, in this case, uh, the the exception to ECP, as you know perfectly well, uh, Luigi Rizzi, I think about 30 years ago, pointed out that in null subject languages, languages where you don't have to express the subject, there's another, like Italian, there's another position for the subject, post-verbal position. And the extraction could be coming, and probably is coming from the post-verbal position. So it's not violating the principle. In fact, it's adhering to the principle. Well, that's the right kind of answer when you get a counterexample. You know, it doesn't work automatically to problem of discovery. Well, if that turns out to be the right way to go, then ECP really is universal. And then comes the question, well, why is it there? Is it an externalization question, or is it just something about uh, minimal computation? And uh, there's a proposal. I have a proposal. Uh, I don't think it's in print even, but I've 
I think I mentioned it in class last fall. He's a ringer, incidentally. He was, knows what he's talking about. But uh, uh, you were there in the class. I think I talked about uh, trying to deduce ECP from inheritance of features from C to T. Okay. If that works, it would be uh, kind of a minimalist computational answer to why the principle is there, again, minimizing computation, and it wouldn't be in uh, the externalization system. Uh, but uh, these are always just open questions. Uh, some of them may be in performance, like uh, Adam Sag has argued that uh, subjacency restrictions are performance restrictions. Maybe so. Uh, the, uh, what's called superiority violations proposed years ago by another research on it, uh, it could turn out to be a, a not, it, it could turn out to be that superiority isn't a real issue, it's a, it's a matter of a, a focal stress, uh, it looks like that might be true, same could be true for a, a, a quantifier reversal, you know, someone saw everyone, uh, Shigeru Miyagawa has argued that. So you really have to just look at the particular cases and try to figure out what the answer is. I mean, it's never self-evident. Ich denke, wir können sozusagen jetzt die Fragen auch etwas öffnen, obwohl ich diese Diskussion unglaublich spannend finde. Und ich sage, also, sorry, um, I've heard that I have to join. So, I think we can open the discussion now also to the topic of the second lecture, although it's fascinating for me as uh, yeah, being not a linguist uh, to follow up this kind of discussion is extremely interesting. So, um, maybe um, we give also here the audience uh, the first, in, in, our, in the order I see the first question, the, the next question already, yeah, and then we move here back to the seminar room and maybe we go back at the end. So, one question that is here. In reference to um, the case you talked about with Ginny, um, our question uh, concerning language acquisition, and what I want to know is, um, do you think that language acquisition is really restricted to a certain age, or does it depend on acquiring any parameter or setting any parameter to learn the various languages or at least to the time? So is language acquisition kind of age restricted? There's uh, almost every, any innate capacity that we know of uh, has uh, what's called a critical period. This actually was studied first by great ethologist Conrad Lawrence back a long time ago. Uh, and it turns out to be pretty universal that uh, if there's an innate capacity, there's a certain period at which it has to uh, be implemented, usually by stimulation. And so it takes a, the capacity for visual perception, recognition of objects. Uh, the visual system, I mean, now that neurology of this is very well understood, again, from experimentation with cats and monkeys, uh, but uh, it's all inside. You know, the, the neurology is constructed so that you see uh, the lines, angles, uh, rigid objects and so on. Uh, however, uh, these famous experiments by Hugo and Weasel about uh, 1960, uh, it turns out that if you deprive a kitten of pattern stimulation, pattern visual stimulation, in the first couple of weeks of life, then the neural systems degenerate and can't be reconstructed. The kitten will be blind, essentially. So it's an innate system, but it has to be stimulated. And it has to have a particular kind of stimulation. If the kitten, say, gets diffuse light, it then doesn't get stimulated. It has to be patterned. And in fact, the nature of the patterns, like how many horizontal lines are there and so on, that's going to affect the neurology of the system and the way the kitten will see. That's the norm for, for um, all biological systems. And it's presumably the norm for language, too. Now, as I've said, and as is obvious, you can't experiment the same way with humans. So you don't raise children in uh, controlled environments to see if uh, they won't develop language. Uh, so there's no direct experimentation. There's no other organisms. You can't do 
comparative work, uh, so you have to use very indirect evidence. But the indirect evidence indicates something that most of us know from experience. Uh, there is a period when language acquisition is almost reflexive. The child can't help learning the language. Uh, it just comes like growing, growing arms. And uh, that seems to be to change typically around puberty. Uh, Post-puberty, it's generally much harder to acquire a language natively. Uh, people can still learn languages, but they typically kind of tack them on to their uh, their own language. So you're kind of learning it more or less by translation. And things like pronunciation, many people just can't do it all. Now there are individual differences. So there are some people who manage to pick up the languages like children uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they're immature or something like that. But, uh, it's, uh, actually, we had a joke in my department at MIT. There was I'm about the worst possible language learner there is, but there was one person in the department, Ken Hale, great linguist who learned languages like a child. He'd go somewhere, a couple of weeks he's talking the language. We used to kid him about being immature, so maybe not. <laughs> uh, anyhow, that, that difference is pretty steady. Uh, by now, it's known that there are other critical periods that also make a difference. There's one apparently around six or so. Uh, and there is some evidence. It's actually this is work that my wife did mostly on uh, Helen Keller type cases, you know, cases of deaf blind uh, it, who do learn language the way I mentioned with facial, but this kind of information, minimal information. That's the way Helen Keller learned it. But, but she got very fluent, but tiny, tiny amount of information. Well, the studies of these people apparently show that uh, uh, around there's a critical period around maybe 18 months, something around that age. And if the child has become deaf-blind, usually a result of spinal meningitis, uh, it loses uh, sight and hearing. Before that age, it'll never acquire a language. You can't use the method of teaching. If it, if the disease comes around that time or later, uh, then the method of teaching works. If you take the famous case, Helen Keller, that's her case. She was, I think, about 20 months. Uh, now, fortunately, you can't investigate this anymore because spinal meningitis is not treatable, so you don't have any more cases. Uh, but uh, uh, the cases that did exist, it's a scattering, seem to break up that way. That has very remarkable implications if you think it through. What it seems to imply is that by about 18 months, the child already knows the whole language, and that what's coming after that is just eliciting the internal knowledge. Now, those of you who know 18-month-old children, though they don't exhibit any knowledge of language, virtually nothing, maybe say a word or two, but apparently it's all going on in there, and they've acquired their native language. Uh, then it can get elicited. Uh, well, if that's the case, there's a very sharp critical period. Uh, there's more evidence about this that's coming coming through. It turns out, as experimentation techniques become better and better, it turns out that you can push the age at which something is acquired lower and lower. Uh, it's by now pretty well established uh, that there's intrauterine learning, that inside the uterus the child is already picking up something about the native language. And it's known by, say, experimentation with cows, you know, you stick a, uh, you stick a hearing device on the uterus, that if you listen to what you're getting, you get kind of muffled speech. And so presumably the infant is getting the same thing. And by the time the, the child is born, it can already distinguish the language of its mother from another language, both spoken by a bilingual woman whose voice it's never heard and experiments are well done. Well, that means as soon as that was discovered, immediately that set off a lot of research on what difference, how do you, what kind of distinctions are made. And it turns out it's not any two languages. Uh, it depends on the prosodic structure of the language, the rhythm, uh, pitch, uh, 
pitch contours, things like that. If languages differ in those structures, then the child, the infant, the newborn infant can distinguish them. If they're more or less the same in those structures, it can't distinguish them. So apparently that's what the infant is picking up. By now, there's a little known about the neurological basis. Apparently, this work by an excellent cognitive neuroscientist, um, Laura Ann Petito, and it's now in Toronto, who appears to have found that, uh, I don't even think this is published yet, but she seems to have found uh, a, a part of, uh, an identifiable part of the human brain, which doesn't exist in other animals, uh, that responds to certain rhythmic properties. And interestingly, they're at about syllable length, roughly syllable length. And it turns out that the infant, this piece of the brain is kind of searching the environment to find structures of that kind. They can be sound or they could be touch or color, almost anything. As long as anything has that kind of rhythmic property, this piece of the brain uh, is stimulated and starts acting. Well, that kind of suggests that that's what's going on uh, prenatally, intrauterine. Uh, and by now it's pretty well known that by, say, about six months, the child has already acquired most of the prosodic system of the language. And by about, say, ten months, roughly, the child has acquired the basic phonetic distinctions. So if you're, say, a Japanese child, and you haven't uh, had evidence about, say, the R-L distinction, uh, it'll never acquire. They'll have to learn it in some other way because that capacity is gone. And uh, there's considerable work of this kind. Also in other cognitive domains, for those of you who've studied Piaget's work, mm -hmm. will know a very important work that he, he proposed stages of... Uh, development, cognitive development. Well, there's been a lot of research into that since, and it turns out that probably none of them exist. If you do the experiments properly, you can show that as early as you can test, uh, the children are making the distinctions. You just have to, it's harder to do experiments with one-year-olds and six-year-olds, but, uh, uh, but if, if you do them in a sophisticated way, you get different. So these are uh, these are very rich research areas, and there's a lot to discover there, but the general picture seems to be that, by and large, uh, language observes the same kind of developmental processes, in particular, the variety of critical periods that you find with uh, uh, other capacities. And so with humans, let's say, the same is true simply for walking. I mean, if a child is... Uh, for one reason or another, it has to be kept in stilts uh, as an infant, so it can't walk, you know. And then if it's, say, cured of whatever the problem is, and <coughs> two years old, the stilts are taken off, it probably can't learn to walk. Uh, you just have to stimulate these things at the right age. But the same is also known at just about social interaction. I mean, it's well known that in orphanages, where children may be physically cared for perfectly well, you know, they're fed and so on, but they don't have normal human interaction. They're just permanently stunted cognitively. All kind of cognitive development just doesn't, doesn't proceed. In fact, it's even known now, this recent work, a very good a neuroscientist, Helen Neville, Oregon's done recent studies uh, on cognitive differences between, uh, depending on socioeconomic level, so in poorer or richer families. And it's well known that there are cognitive differences, but she's discovered that there are neural differences in testing. As she proceeded further, she found that a lot of this just depends on how the parents talk to the children. So if you have a culture, usually lower socioeconomic levels, where the ch parents don't talk to the children, they just yell at them you know, shut up or get out of the house or something like that, uh, then uh, the children have sort of normal language, but they don't have normal cognitive development. And it works uh, as therapeutically. Like if she's, she's, of course, tried to figure out, uh, can you cure it? And if it turns out that if you have kind of family training, you know, you kind of train the parents to 
that talk to the children the way the middle upper class educated people talk to their children, you know, read them stories and interact with them and so on, then the cognitive difficulties uh, are considerably overcome. Uh, so, so there's something going on. Uh, if you let go long enough, it'll be a permanent uh, deficiency. But there are all kinds of differences of stimulation which affect uh, neural development and cognitive development. Uh, language is a case in point. It seems to work like others. Yes, I have a Ihre Frage kommt zum Schluss. Ja, aber ich fange einfach hier an. We're still in linguistics, right? Um, you, but you can also change now. We have now open. You can, we can, <laughs> <that's what laughs> you can, but you can also change to the second topic. Okay, okay. Uh, Professor Chow, uh, it's me here. <laughs> um, I, as a stubborn synthetization, I very much like this uh, stru uh, structure preserving principle. And, and I, uh, structure preserving principle. And I, I, I was wondering, um, I, I could not see it in the phase theory. I mean, I, I miss I miss the structure preserving principle in your phase theory. Phase Cor theory. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, I, it doesn't. I mean, the structure preserving principle is obviously there. You know, you see it all over the place. It shows up in the trivial case that I mentioned, say auxiliary fronting, but all over the place. Why? I don't think it has to do with phases. Uh, the only good explanation I can think of, or I know of, is the one I mentioned, that uh, linear order just is not available. Uh, it's, it's simply unavailable to the computational system, meaning it comes from externalization. So it's plainly there in externalization, but that could well be just a reflex of the sensory motor system. Um, we don't talk in parallel, we have to talk in sequence. So the sensory motor system is imposing the requirement that you have some kind of order. And incidentally, it can be different kinds. So in sign, it's quite different. Uh, in sign, you do do things in parallel. So say in American Sign Language, uh, to ask a question, it's just a declarative assertion, but you, know, you raise your eyebrows through the whole question. Okay, that's uh, parallel. Speaking, you know, produced. Uh, but something, various kinds of organization are imposed by the sensory motor system. And it could be that linear order is one of them, in which case structure preserving is just minimal computation, period. Uh, there's no alternative. And I, I mentioned the other day some neurological evidence. Uh, turns out, I'll say it again, that uh, there's some evidence now from a group in Milan that uh, if you try to teach people what from their point of view are nonsense languages, if they satisfy universal grammar principles, then the Broca's area, the language area, is activated. But if you try to teach them something that involves linear order, like negate a sentence by putting the negative particle after the third word, a very trivial computational thing, then they can solve it, but they're not using Broca's area. Uh, they're using other parts of the brain, so they're reflexively treating it as a puzzle, not a, not a language. Uh, th this kind of evidence is accumulating, but there's also counter evidence. Uh, Richard Kane's work, which I mentioned, is a very significant work. Uh, he argues quite strongly that uh, linear order has to be in the core component, so you just have you know, the usual contradictions that you find in science as evidence pointing opposite ways. Um, I'd like to thank you for being here, but more importantly, I'd like to thank you for serving as an example, not just for me, but for, for many people, the way you conduct yourself, the way you live your life. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I, I'm a teacher at a university. I try to conduct my classes <coughs> according to anarchist principles. Uh, usually I don't say it uh, because the 
one word that's about to shock people is the word anarchist or anarchy. Um, but I'm wondering if you think that education can become more effective through a reduction in hierarchy at schools and universities. And I have a practical question. Uh, I found a, a summer school for kids. And uh, it's also run on anarchist principles, but I was very careful not to include the word anarchist in the title of the school, in the name of the school. Uh, do you think that's wise? Do you, do you think we can ever recover uh, the, the true meaning of this word? Or has it been, has it been too polluted in the popular consciousness? Thanks. It, uh, it's possible that it's been too polluted, but that's true of just about every word of political discourse. So in the United States, for example, the word liberal is unpronounceable. Uh, you have to call yourself a progressive if you're a liberal or you're some kind of maniac. Uh, but uh, and even to the extent that liberal is used, it's used in the way which is opposite to its meaning. So you go back to classical liberalism, it's what's now called conservatism. Uh, liberal, social democratic, which you can't use the term. Uh, capitalism is unusable. Actually, one of the most interesting cases in the United States, it's all over the media and uh, Congress and everything else. You see it everywhere. There's an obscene word in English. It's so obscene that I can't say it. You know, maybe there are children listening. Uh, so I'll spell it. It's spelled P-R-O-F-I-T-S. That's unpronounceable. It's obscene. But there's a way of pronouncing it. It's called jobs. <laughs> so uh, when you hear the president or a congressman saying, uh, we've got to do such and such, like uh, reduce taxes on corporations, because we have to get more jobs. What they mean is we have to get more profits, but you can't say that. Uh, and uh, So yes, anarchism has been poisoned, but so have most words. Uh, that's part of political propaganda. Uh, on the other hand, the principle that you mentioned correctly eliminating hierarchy, illegitimate hierarchy. I think that's as natural as learning language. I think everybody agrees with that. If it's presented that way, yes, why should we have uh, illegitimate authority? If there's some kind of uh, hierarchic uh, uh, structure, some structure of authority and domination, it's not self-justifying. It has to justify itself. If it can't, it should be dismantled. Sometimes it can, but take teaching. Uh, a teacher's part of the duty of the most open minded, you know, anarchist teacher is going to be to structure what the child is acquiring in some fashion. Actually, there's a kind of classic description of this. It's in uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was one of the, you probably know, one of the founders of the modern education, higher educational system. It was a one of the founders of classical liberalism, uh, he suggested that uh, the image that they used was uh, education shouldn't be thought of as pouring, like pouring water into a vessel, but it should be thought of as uh, laying out a string along which the learner proceeds in his or her own way, creatively, but with some kind of structure. Well, I think that kind of authority can be justified. Uh, to reel with his authority, but uh, pouring water into a vessel, I don't think, can be justified. And uh, can this work? Sure, it can work. I mean, any decent, say, graduate, any decent education in the sciences uh, tries to achieve that, maybe it fails, but at least it tries. So when you're, you know, there's one great physicist, uh, one leading 20th century physicist, uh, Victor Weisskopf, who taught freshman courses at MIT, as most of the senior faculty does. And he was famous because uh, in the freshman course, first course, uh, students would ask him, what are we going to cover in this course? And his standard answer is, it doesn't matter what we cover, it matters what you discover. Uh, that's what we're doing here. You're going to discover things. And if the student challenges what the professor is saying, that's good. That's what you encourage. In fact, a lot of innovation comes along that way. Uh, most of us experience this in graduate courses often. Uh, somebody says, I don't believe that. That's wrong. I have 
another way of doing it. That's fine. That's what you encourage. It's often right. It's the way a lot of um, progress takes place. And that can go on at the kindergarten level, too. I, luckily for me, I have to experience it. I was in a, a Deweyite school, there's a John Dewey-style school, which is kind of run along these lines from actually before I was about 18 months old, because my parents were working with us, I was in nursery school up until uh, till I got to high school, till about age 12. And it was a very free, uh, open place, a lot of creative work, a lot of cooperative work. Uh, nobody was graded. Uh, no, it wasn't until I got to high school that I knew I was a good student, because the question never came up. As soon as you get to high school, you know, you're A or B, you're ranked you're third in the class, whatever it may be. It's a totally different system. And, uh, I, I mean, I knew that I had, sk- everyone knew that I'd skipped a class, but all that that meant was I was the smallest kid in the class. No, nothing, no other conclusions were drawn from it, either by me or anyone else. Uh, and uh, in high school, it's all different. Ranking, coercion. Uh, I can remember what went on in my childhood school very well. I can't remember anything from high school. It's like a black hole. I knew I got through it. I had to get a scholarship to college, so something must have worked, but I don't know what it was. That was pouring the water into a vessel and uh, ranking people on how well they churned out the water. So sure, you can do it from kindergarten on through graduate school. And I think it can be done very successfully. And pretty much along Humboldt's lines. You kind of, there is some organized structure, but then the student has to figure out their own way uh, to work through it, maybe original ways, but working together with others, but with no reason to rank them at all. I mean, you give exams, but those are only for measures of progress. It doesn't matter what they, how they come out. The actual systems that are in place are quite different. I don't know how it works here, but in the United States, at least, the educational system is, from kindergarten up, is moving towards uh, training for the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Constant constant tests. I mean, I've had talk to teachers who tell me, complaining about this. A couple weeks ago, I was talking to a sixth grade teacher who teaches kids about eight or nine or something. She told me that uh, they were talking about something in class, and some little girl came up to her after class and said she was really interested in this. How could she pursue it more? And the teacher had to tell her, you can't do it because you have to study for this exam. Uh, and if you don't pass the exam, you're going to be in trouble, and I'm going to be in trouble because the teachers are graded, are graded on how well, they, how well the kids do in the exams, like how much water they've poured into the vessel. Well, I'm sure you've all had the experience of studying for an exam, you know, learning everything, doing perfect, and two days later you forgot what the subject was. That's uh, that's what it's like if you force edu- if you force training to people, and that's the way the system is moving. Uh, and as I say, even teachers are being graded on it, so they're kind of compelled to do it. They'll lose their jobs, lose their cut some salary if they don't pour enough water into the vessels. Now that's a very destructive form of education. But uh, anarchist style education, is really not called that, uh, that works extremely well, I think. Um, dear Mr. Chomsky, I got a more uh, personal, maybe also a bit naive question for you. Um, you deal mostly with political to- topics and problems uh, which are pretty depressing and sad to deal with, um, from the politics of your country to the general, general state of the world um, and its people. I also experienced that in my studies. Um, now my question is, um, how does that personally affect you and uh, and what is it that um, that keeps you going on and, and dealing with all of this without turning cynic or depressed? <laughs> I mean, how it affects me, uh, well, that's my wife, not, not me. But uh, the, uh, uh, I 
how many deal with the depression problems because those are the problems. You know, you can talk about how wonderful something is, but you know, who cares? You know, you're trying to improve, to change. So it's a problem. So from a certain point of view, it's depressing. It's not necessarily depressing. In fact, you look over a period of time, and there's considerable progress. Uh, things change. They change for the better very often. So let's say uh, in the lifetime of most of you, say from the 1960s up till today, roughly then, there's been a lot of progress. I don't know anything about this university, but I suspect it's the same as the ones I do know about. It's like my own, say, MIT. When I got to MIT in the 1950s, it was very different from the way it is today. In the 1950s, it was almost entirely white males, uh, well-dressed, uh, you know, the hierarchic personal relations, the style of dress reflects human relations, uh, no political activity, the people working on the problems that they had to work on, laser-like intensity. Uh, over the years, it changed. Uh, you walk, look at it today, it kind of looks like this. It's about half women, uh, about a third minorities, uh, informal dress, which reflects informal relations, uh, a lot of interaction, in fact, the student interaction, a lot of political activity of all kinds. Uh, well, that's a big, that's, and that's happened everywhere. It's a big change that came about mainly from the 60s, activism and what followed. A lot of it is what followed. So the feminist movement probably had more impact on the social, on the society than anything else. It's mostly from the 70s. But the environmental movement was, you know, 90s. The anti-nuclear movement was uh, the 80s. The global justice movement's now big. Uh, those are very recent in the past decade. Uh, so there are, there's plenty of progress. And there's regression also. So there's both. But you can celebrate the progress, but not much point to it. The important thing is to look at the existing problems and the regression and to do something about them. As to how you feel about it, that's kind of irrelevant. You can, it's a personal, personal matter. You kind of, about all you can do is uh, pursue a kind of Pascal's wager. That you can decide to be pessimistic and depressed and not do anything, and in that case you ensure that the worst happens, or you can choose to be uh, optimistic and look forward and try to do what you can, and you may be able to improve things. Well, it's not much of a choice. Uh, so I don't think there's anything to say about that. Uh, just make your choices. Uh, I forget we are I something out of the question. <laughs> My question is concerning the Arab world and the Arab Spring. What are the tasks the Arab people should immediately do in order to fight against internal and external forces that uh, try anything uh, to stop the democratization of the region? They don't want a real change uh, in the most important region of the world. Uh, you said yesterday uh, they are. Uh, it is a very important region, they want, don't want to lose uh, the control on resources. What can uh, the Arab people uh, do about this? They can do exactly what they're doing. Um, there, are very, there are very dramatic developments in the Arab world in the last, just in the last few months. Uh, very successful ones, in fact. Um, and they've won considerable successes. Like in Egypt, which is the most important country and has had the most progress, but they haven't overthrown the traditional regime. The military are still in charge, but the protesters are still at it. Uh, big protests and every Friday, Tucker Square and so on. And they're now confronting the military for the first time. Uh, before this, the protests were mostly uh, uh, applauding the military because the military were had, sh had turned against the dictatorship, but now the military is back in, is back in control and is trying to, uh, there's torture going on, uh, you know, 
prison bill to imposing restrictions. And the protesters haven't given up by any means. Uh, if you're from that region, you know better than I do. Uh, they're going ahead. Uh, and they've already won some significant, uh, they've had some significant achievements. Uh, the press in Egypt, for example, Tunisia also is much more free than it was before. Uh, before it was mostly a state press, uh, not worth looking at. Uh, now at the uh, al Ahram major journal, it's really worth reading. It's a free, open, independent journal, more so than ours, I think. Uh, but a uh, 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 crucial part is uh, labor organizing. The labor, there's a very, been a very militant labor movement in Egypt for a long time. Constant struggles, some victories, a lot of repression and uh, violence, but uh, now they're organizing freely and in fact going pretty far. There are some cases where uh, uh, worker uh, managed, worker owned and managed uh, industrial complexes are beginning to function. That's way beyond us. So they're, uh, they're moving ahead, they're meeting a lot of repression. Uh, as I mentioned, the West is totally opposed, doing everything it can to keep the uh, old regimes in place. That's to be expected. Also to be expected is they'll claim the opposite. They'll claim their love of democracy and freedom. They disregard what uh, the political leaders and you know, intellectual leaders say. Uh, forget about it. Uh, but what they're doing is uh, trying to repress it and constrain it. It's perfectly understandable. Uh, they understand perfectly well that if Arab public opinion were to begin to influence policy, that the West would be in real trouble. I gave some of the reasons uh, yesterday, I guess. Say them again if you want. Uh, so that's going to continue. What can we do? Well, we're not... Uh, you, know, you and I, we're not in Tupper Square, we're here. Uh, but we can influence our own government. Uh, they are the ones who are trying to repress democracy and freedom. Uh, we, we don't face torture chambers, military and so on. We have a lot more freedom and options than uh, the Egyptians, Tunisians, uh, Syrians and others do, and we can use it. We can use it to influence our own government so that they'll at least tolerate uh, moves towards freedom and democracy, maybe even support that can be done too. So there's no shortage of things to do, just a shortage of will to do them. Um, I would like to give a question. Um, I would like to um, uh, give the opportunity for question here from the audience, David. David, please, please question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Professor Chomsky, um, thanks for being, being here. Um, my question is this. I think it was um, Bertrand Russell who once uh, described the um, human instincts as, I don't have the exact quote, but enemies of reason and justice. Other way, uh, in other words, it will always lead to conformism, to prejudice and racism. Um, on the other hand, we have you talking about the creativity that is involved in every um, act of using language. And in your debate with Foucault, you talked about the creativity as a fundamental human characteristic. So do you think there is um, a possibility to be much more optimistic about human nature than Russell was? Well, um, Russell, the person I respect a lot, in fact, the only person whose portrait is a picture is on the wall in his office, but uh, uh, I, he was repeating something that's familiar and in part true. There are Parts of human nature are very regressive. That's why you get oppression, violence, uh, torture, and it's all part of human nature. Uh, on the other hand, other parts of human nature are quite different. Uh, striving for freedom, becoming uh, authority, uh, uh, striving for justice, it's all part of human nature. 
it's all instincts, if you like. There's a range of instinctive behavior that humans have, and the appropriate task is to cultivate the uh, the, the ones that are benevolent and suppress the ones that are harmful. That's uh, what life is about. And there have been, as I mentioned, there's been plenty of progress. But the things that were taken for granted not very long ago are considered intolerable today. I mean, take another example. Take uh, homosexuality. Take Britain and the United States, and very free societies. Uh, in the United States, until about 1960, it was criminal. In Britain, uh, well, there's a famous case which illustrates it. One of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, Alan Turing, who also helped save Britain from destruction during the Second World War. He was one of the people who decoded the uh, German codes, which enabled Britain to survive the bombings and so on. So he's a national hero, also one of the top mathematicians, a sort of founder of modern computer theory. Uh, he was an homosexual. In the early 1950s, the British government essentially murdered him. They didn't call it murder, but what they did was force him to undergo treatment for his disease, okay, because it was considered disease, and the uh, the treatment ended up doing some horrible thing to him. He committed suicide. Okay, uh, that's unheard of today. In maybe in some countries it still exists, but not here. You know, not in England, not in the United States, not here. I'm sure. Uh, now it's just a way of life accepted like others. There's still discrimination, but there's enormous progress. Okay, that's a lot of human histories like that. And that's why we don't have uh, slavery, uh, feudalism. Uh, 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 there's plenty of domestic abuse, but now it's opposed. But take, say, Strauss Kahn. Uh, a couple of years ago, that wouldn't have been a problem. And now there's cultural differences. Like in France, they think the United States is too puritanic. In the United States, I think uh, it's right in this case. Uh, furthermore, there are other things about this case that are not discussed that are critically significant. The, the hotel where this incident took place it happens to be unionized. Now, there's eff all kind of efforts to destroy the last remnants of the union movement, but the unions protect people. If this woman had been in a non-unionized hotel, she would have just been fired. You're in a non-unionized hotel. Uh, a rich guest uh, makes, you know, you complain about a rich guest, you get fired. Okay, but she was protected by the union, and there's support for it, overwhelming support in the country. Okay, those are significant changes. Uh, uh, go back 30 or 40 years, domestic abuse was not even an issue. The police didn't deal with domestic abuse. And now, in the United States, at least every town has special police units that deal just with domestic abuse. It's not tolerated. Okay, those are big changes, and uh, plenty of others. So this, you can be quite up. These are other uh, expressions of our instinctive nature. Our moral realm kind of expands over time. It's now expanding to animal rights. That's new. Uh, so you can't do any pot, any experiment you like in, uh, say, MIT and Harvard. The city has restrictions on uh, how animals have to be treated. Okay, it's expanding the moral range, and I think it should go on. In recent uh, minimalist literature, there has been critique that under feature drivenness, the inclusiveness condition, and the output conditions, syntax has lost its status of autonomy. Do you think that minimalist syntax has become too lexicalist, maybe? Has become. Uh, do you think that minimalist syntax has become too lexicalist? Too lexicalist. Well, first of all, let me say a word about autonomy. That's a notion that's been pretty seriously misunderstood. Autonomy of syntax just meant that the syntactic rules operate without paying attention to, for example, uh, 
you know, lexical meaning or uh, uh, whether the sentence is true or false or something like that. Uh, that's what autonomy of syntax meant. Now, at the time, in the 1950s, that was a like a radical choice because it was assumed that, uh, for example, take Quine, you know, famous logician philosopher, that which was kind of orthodox, that uh, grammatical status is just uh, a reflection of meaningfulness. If a sense is meaningless, it's ungrammatical. Okay, that was quickly shown to be wrong. So that's autonomy of syntax. Uh, and that remains. I don't think there's been any change in the assumption that the uh, syntactic rules of the language are basically independent of for example, questions of truth or falsity, things like that. Actually, it's not only true of the syntax, it's also true of the formal semantics. But what's called semantics in linguistics is actually syntax, technically. It's symbol manipulation. Uh, semantic, you, you move from, in the traditional sense, you know, sense of uh, Frege, Peirce, you know, way back into the medieval, medieval ages, the syntax means essentially symbol manipulation. Uh, you get to semantics when you relate it to the outside world. Uh, so what are you referring to, for example? Is it true or false? That's semantics. But what's called semantics doesn't deal with it. It deals with symbol manipulation. It's all fundamentally syntax. And uh, it's all autonomous in, in this sense. And that remains. Now the other question, the technical one, is it becoming too dependent on the lexicon? Well, it depends on what the facts are. Should it be dependent on the lexicon? So take features, which you mentioned. Uh, they're part of lexical items. Uh, and you get into quite interesting questions here. Like uh, I mentioned before that any computational system, by definition, is going to have certain atoms of computation. But what are they? Uh, first guess is they're lexical items. Uh, but that's not obviously true. And exactly what you mentioned is... Uh, case in point. So can features function independently inside the computational system? Okay, or do you have to, do they only function as part of complexes, bigger complexes, which are the atoms? And that leads directly to uh, uh, questions under intense investigation. So for example, I mentioned feature inheritance, the, you know, the five features, the structural features like uh, agreement, case, and so on. It is pretty good evidence that they're in the uh, category C, you know, the clausal, top clausal category, but that they show up in the inside the sentence in the tense, so they're kind of inherited. Well, the question is, are they inherited uh, individually or are they inherited as a complex? Actually, if they're inherited as a complex, then the question particle will also be inherited. And that leads to an answer to the ECP problem. On the other hand, there are other approaches that say, no, they have to be entered separately. Well, you know, <coughs> open research questions. No, not negative income. Um, unconditional uh, basic income, which is an international well, basic, basically every, every month you get paid for not being at work. Yeah, so a, a minimal subsistence for everybody internationally. That makes good sense. But, people, but that's, like, that's essentially what uh, a decent, uh, any decent health and welfare system provides nationally. Uh, not in the United States, unfortunately, but I think here, for example, as far as I understand, there is a minimal subsistence guarantee. Health, everyone gets health care. Uh, uh, everyone gets enough to have enough food to eat, let's say. I mean, that's uh, by now normal in industrial societies. I mean, maybe it doesn't work all the time, but at least it's the principle. In the United States, too. Like, uh, there's... Uh, and uh, uh, health care is sh shambles, but uh, there is... Uh, you know, uh, technically, there's food available for everyone. The food banks and so on. Again, it doesn't work perfectly, but theoretically, it's there. There's an earned income tax credit if a person's working. Unfortunately, this is not for people who aren't working. If a person is working and doesn't have enough income, say, for a family to survive, and it's 
upgraded automatically. Actually, this comes from the last uh, liberal social democratic president in the United States, Richard Nixon. Uh, ever since then, these things have been degraded. But sure, that makes sense. If it's national, why not international? Uh, actually, I, I might add that theoretically every country is committed to this. If you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which everyone, practically everybody signed, uh, take a look at Article 25, it says every person must be, everywhere must be guaranteed uh, health, uh, education, uh, food, and so on. Well, you know, those are words, but uh, at least in principle, every country, practically every country is committed to them. Hello, Mr. Chomsky. Um, I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, I've got a question. What's your position of the um, actual nuclear crisis, which started with uh, Fukushima, and why do you think don't uh, people in America go to the streets uh, the same way the people in Europe go to the streets? And what can you do as a writer and a famous public person to, um, to bring the, the, the uh, critical position um, to America? Well, it's, it's plainly a crisis, and the German reaction is uh, so far unique, as far as I know, in, in moving towards canceling uh, nuclear power. I hope it spreads elsewhere. Uh, as for going into the streets, there's plenty of that in the United States. I mean, take what just happened in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, the last few months. Uh, the, the governor, the ultra-right-wing governor, backed by a couple of multi-billionaires, Koch brothers, also the funders of the Tea Party, uh, they wanted to ram through uh, legislation uh, to ban collective bargaining rights for uh, public sector union workers. Now that led to a huge popular reaction. There were tens of thousands of people in the streets every day. The state capitol was occupied a couple of times. Uh, and it's continuing. I mean, the governor's now trying to ram through as much rotten legislation as he can because the whole uh, uh, party might be thrown out in the coming elections. It very likely will be. Uh, that's only one example. But there's plenty of activism. And not enough, you know, but uh, certainly there. In fact, one of the dramatic moments of the past few months was about March sometime when uh, a message was sent by uh, one of the major Egyptian labor, labor leaders, Kamal Abbas, one of the organizers of the Egyptian uh, protests. Uh, he sent a message in the name of the Egyptian labor movement to uh, working people in Madison, Wisconsin, expressing their solidarity with American workers. It's kind of sad that that has to happen, but it did happen. <laughs> Uh, the Fukushima case, well, you know, as you've read in the newspapers, uh, every day the Japanese government releases a little more information about how they were lying about it. And they just a couple of days ago uh, conceded that the, that the actual radiation level was about double what they had claimed. And this process has been going on uh, since the, uh, the catastrophe. It's a huge catastrophe. Uh, there's some talk in Japan, finally, about uh, doing something about nuclear power. And there are options. They're not stuck with nuclear power by any means. Uh, but uh, it's a major crisis. Everybody ought to be reacting to it. There was a meeting of the G8, you know, eight rich countries that just ended yesterday where there were some uh, formal responses to it. Like, Let's have better nuclear safety and so on. Here in Germany, really is in the lead, it's taking the right position. Um, hello, Mr. Chomsky. Sorry, I'm a little bit excited. Um, um, I'm a Kurdish woman, um, but I never learned Kurdish because um, I'm coming from Turkey. It was uh, my language was forbidden, and uh, we learned all the time Turkish at school and at home. 
uh, my mother spoke with my grandmother in Kurdish and with me in Turkish. And my communication with my grandmother, it wasn't easy. Only a few words and mostly, mostly uh, with body language. So I'm an adult, adult person and um, I learn uh, foreign languages, German and English. Um, I mean, I have the ability, I learn it uh, very quickly and I also like it. But underline, I have my borders. I mean, um, I learn it, but then I stop to learn. Do you mean or do you think that maybe this is related to that I know um, I never learned my own mother language? The first question is that, and the second is... Uh, uh, what exactly was the question? I, I, I know what you're talking about, in fact. Yes, uh, I mean, do you think, because I think so, uh, I don't learn the foreign, foreign language more because I know I didn't learn my own language. Yeah. Uh, maybe is it my border, and be, um, is it possible to uh, to take this border uh, away? And the second uh, question: the native own language of all occupied countries uh, are not going to be forbidden. Uh, what's the target? Why are the own languages of some occupied countries going to be forbidden? And um, what do you think about the future of Kurdish issue uh, beyond the Arabic uprising? Because Erdogan uh, gives uh, all the time the democracy message on the Arabic leaders, but in their own country, in Turkey, uh, the Kurdish people are going to be taken under press. And, uh, yeah. What do you think about this? What do you think about the Kurdish uh, well, issue? The Kurds are roughly 25 million people scattered over a number of countries. The major concentrations in Turkey, southeastern Turkey, as you know, and uh, they, I suppose, are the major ethnic group that has no national, anything like a national state or some form of political representation. The Turkish case is the worst, has been the worst. I mean, aside from particular moments, like in the 1980s under uh, Saddam Hussein, the, the Kurds in Iraq were subjected to horrendous treatment. Al-Anfal, you know, Halabja, and so on. Uh, contrary to what many people believe, the West was had a lot of responsibility for that. Uh, the Reagan administration denied that it was happening. They insisted that it was Iran that was carrying out the atrocities. The reason was because the United States and its allies were quite strongly supporting Saddam Hussein. So they wanted him to be... Uh, in fact, the Reagan administration intervened to prevent any uh, denunciation of it even. <laughs> a long, ugly story. But apart from that period, over time, the worst repression has been in Turkey. In the 1990s, it was one of the worst uh, uh, humanitarian catastrophes in the world. Uh, the Turkish uh, army, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, <clears throat> in the 1990s, <clears throat> They, carried, they were carrying out a counterinsurgency campaign in southeastern Turkey, which uh, killed tens of thousands of people and destroyed, according to Turkish statistics, about 3,500 towns and villages, uh, uh, of, probably millions of refugees. I mean, I, I've been there a number of times. You go to Istanbul, and there are sections of Istanbul in horrendous, miserable slums, you know, decaying buildings. Uh, the only people who live there are Kurdish refugees from the southeast. The children can't get out of the room, it's too dangerous, and so on. Uh, but it's improved. The first time I went there was in 2000. And incidentally, this was all supported by the West, primarily the United States, but also Germany and England. Uh, the United States was providing practically all the arms, about 80% of the arms, to the Turkish army. Uh, the flow of arms in the year, one year, single year, 1997, which was about the peak of the atrocities, the Clinton administration in that single year sent more arms to Turkey than the in, than in the entire Cold War period combined up until the onset of the counterinsurgency campaign. This is undiscussable in the United States. It wasn't reported. Uh, the New York Times, for example, had a well-known reporter in Ankara. 
he refused to report it. Uh, there's a few people and a couple, a small number of people, I was actually one, who were protesting and trying to get it known, but it was suppressed. You could tell me about Germany, but I suspect it was suppressed here too. Germany was also providing arms, not on that scale, but significant. Britain too. So this is basically Western-backed massive atrocities. Uh, in uh, I, I got there right afterwards, year 2000, I think, 2002, around then. Uh, I, I went for a Kurdish uh, language case. A publisher was on trial. Our own publisher, you probably know all this, but uh, who was on trial for uh, translating a book of mine? Uh, and the book wasn't about Turkey, but it had about five pages or ten pages on these Turkish atrocities. So he was on trial, and you know I went to take part in the trial. His lawyer, who was and became the mayor of Diyarbakir, Osman Baydemir, uh, he suggested that I. Uh, insist on becoming a co-defendant at the trial. The trials are a total fraud. They're military trials. You don't have to make any further comment. So uh, he thought that if I insisted on being co-defendant, they'd probably drop the trial, which is exactly what happened. So I was a co-defendant. The prosecutor and the judge uh, had obviously agreed. They'd been ordered, you know, ter terminate the trial, too much negative publicity in Europe, and so they terminated, he was let off but later, back in court again. Uh, it was pretty ugly then. I went around, uh, I went to Djarbak here, so at least in Turkey, with uh, some Tur Turkish human rights activists. They're very, Turkey's the only country that I know where leading intellectuals, very prominent intellectuals, major writers, uh, academics, uh, journalists, uh, Publishers, they not only protest the atrocities, they're carrying out constant civil disobedience against them and facing harsh sentences, sometimes in Europe. No country like that that I know of. In fact, the intellectuals are usually just servants of power. Uh, Turkey's unique. But when I come to Europe and I hear people talk about how Turkey isn't civilized enough to be led into the European Union, you have to laugh. I mean, they can teach lessons to Western intellectuals. Uh, very, of course, they won't listen, they won't report it, but it's a striking difference. So I was able to go with them to Djarbakir, take part in some protests, the prosecutor's office and so on. In Djarbakir, uh, when you walked around town in those days, I, I was also going with the the main investigator for Human Rights Watch, very good man. He was later kicked out of the country because he's too good. Uh, but uh, he knew, knew Kurdish, knew Turkish, you know, understood the situation. And uh, he would occasionally direct me away from a certain street. We were, of course, followed by Turkish security people. And if, he, if there was a street where there were children playing who had among them the colors of the Kurdish flag, he didn't want me to go down that street because after I left, the families would be picked up and thrown in jail. You know. So we went somewhere else. And there were people living in caves and the walls of the Arbacir, it's a walled city. It was pretty ugly. But that was, I think, 2002 or 2000 or so. I went back a little later, there were some improvements. Now, the last time I was there was quite considerably improved. Now, there, there is now, there is a you still can't teach Kurdish in schools, but uh, it's more open. I mean, there's a Kurdish radio station. People now talk Kurdish freely. They're not afraid to you know, show the colors of the flag. Uh, there's more tolerance. It's an improvement. So yes, it's still plenty of repression, but uh, nothing like it was like in the 90s or even the early part of the millennium. So that's to the good, and uh, Europe could make a difference. Instead of uh, pretending that uh, sir, Turkey, I'm sure the reason for not allowing Turkey into the European Union has nothing to do with human rights violations. It has to do with the fact that Germans don't want to have Turks walking around in the street or something like that. But uh, it's European racism. But um, uh, it, it can have a very uh, positive effect here if policies change. 
So I, I, you're right that it's a bad situation, but things can be done. As to uh, learning, not learning your native language, I mean, that's a serious problem. There's no general theory about it, but uh, if people are deprived forcefully of their native language, culture, society, it has a damaging effect, a severely damaging effect, and it's something that shouldn't be tolerated. They shouldn't be tolerated in uh, the Western countries either, so I don't know how it works here, but in the United States, uh, there's a strong, the big Hispanic population in the United States, and many of them flee from horrendous atrocities carried out by the United States and Latin America, still fleeing, in fact. Uh, but uh, they come to the United States if they can make it. And they are, the children are permitted into the school system, but there's, a, but there's an issue about whether they should be allowed to have bilingual education. Should they be allowed to study in their own language? Well, you know, by any civilized criteria, they should. They'll learn the second language anyway, and uh, they'll get ahead more effectively if they can study in their own language. Uh, that's a big issue. It probably exists here, too. I don't know. You probably know. Uh, so sure, it should be permitted. In fact, it should be encouraged. These are other major human rights issues. And it can have an effect. You said it had an effect on you. I don't doubt it. Mr. Chomsky, it's an honor to hear you speak in person. Um, I study linguistics, uh, but work as a journalist, so I also have two questions. <laughs> um, the first one is uh, related to this idea of um, this kind of proto-mother language that, um, you know, maybe this is more of a pop culture, kind of persistent pop culture idea that um, there was this one mother language, perhaps, your theoretical Eve met her theoretical Adam somewhere in Africa, and they and their offspring developed this mother tongue that somehow the rest of the languages in the world branched off of. Um, so what's your take on that first? Secondly, um, I was uh, recently talking to a sociologist um, doing a story about the um, left radical actions in um, Berlin for May Day, and um, he described the movement. He said, what he said, and this was really interesting to me, was that um, anarchism basically doesn't exist in Germany. He was really talking about anarcho-syndicalism and you know, that kind of strain of anarchism. And what he, the word he used to describe um, you know, kind of what came out of the, I guess, starting with the student movement and the squatters and anti-nuclear is autonomous autonomous movement, and I wanted to get your take on uh, shifting of labels, because anarchists have also unfortunately taken on a whole negative uh, array of meanings that have nothing to do, actually, with anarchism. So, two questions. Thank you. Well, as far as the mother language is concerned, as far as I can see, that's about the only coherent possibility. So, we'll go back to Eve, maybe Adam, we don't know. But whoever had this uh, mutation, they, that person developed the language, an internal language. When it got externalized in the small group, it was everybody's language. Uh, after that, by about 50,000 years ago, some small group left Africa it very quickly expanded over the whole world. I mean, they didn't have a look down 10, 20,000 years, they're everywhere. Uh, by about 30,000 years ago, they're all over Europe. Uh, actually, first went down along the southern uh, part of Eurasia, Papua New Guinea, and so on, but uh, then moved up and came back towards Europe as the Ice Age receded and so on. Uh, at that point, they were already separating into many different languages. Uh, probably, whatever the reason, uh, maybe the ones we were talking about. But that there was a particular mother language is almost certain, unless there was multiple genesis, which is conceivable. I can't prove that there wasn't, but it's hard to believe. Uh, why should they all have the same properties? And it's very striking to notice that uh, this, there is strong evidence for it, that there has been no evolutionary change for 50,000 years. Uh, you take a 
child from a remote tribe in Papua New Guinea or the Amazon, which had no human contact. Uh, you take a child from there, they're the same as children here, they'll learn the same language, the same, become quantum physicists, and anything. There are individual differences, but there are no known group differences in cognitive capacity or language capacity. So apparently whatever happened was done 50,000 years ago and didn't begin much before that. Uh, so yes, I think there's good evidence that there was a mother language. Uh, we can't recover it, of course. In fact, historical linguistics uh, it goes back maybe 10,000 years. It doesn't come anywhere near the point of the origin of language. Uh, but uh, um, as for the uh, anarchism question, uh, it's true that anarchism got a bad name, but it got it in the late 19th century. You know, assassinations, uh, uh, unprovoked uh, violence. So There's a strain of what was called the anarchist movement, which was very destructive. On the other hand, there was a strain that was very constructive, like an anarcho-syndicalism, which is a major strain of, uh, of anarchism, actually developed substantially in Germany, most of France and uh, Switzerland, but also in Germany, people like uh, Rudolf Rocker, one of the major anarcho-syndicalist uh, thinkers, and was originally Germany, went to London uh, and the United States. But uh, does it have an effect? I think it has a big effect. I mean, it takes a, a co-determination in the, the German industrial system. Well, you know, doesn't work the way it ought to, but something is there. And I think it comes from these libertarian strains, you know, which uh, were reflected in the anarcho-syndicalist movement. Now, the great success of anarcho-syndicalism was uh, in the Latin countries. In fact, Marx, who was pretty authoritarian, uh, one of the reasons he destroyed the First International uh, was because there was too much influence of the uh, anarchists in the Latin countries. He thought it ought to be German-centered. Uh, so he basically destroyed it, finally moved it to the United States, disappeared. But, uh, and it was quite, it reached its, uh, its major peak in Spain in 1936, which is a very important development. That's, uh, there was a major anarchist revolution in Spain since Franco came on the scene. It liberated a lot of uh, Spain created uh, anarchist institutions which were pretty successful. Uh, it faced uh, and it was attacked from every side. Uh, Hitler and Mussolini attacked it. They sent troops to Franco. Uh, the liberal democracies attacked it. Uh, uh, Russia was right in the, at the peak of the attack on the hated anarchism and Stalinism. They, just, they were the police and so on. They you know, killed the leading activists and crushed it. In fact, this is what we call the Spanish Civil War actually took place pretty much after all sides had agreed to crush the anarchist revolution. After that, then they turned to fighting over the spoils, who'd pick it up. You know. But that was a real success, and it's never been reconstituted or anything like that. Uh, the autonomous movements had different sources, uh, some of them roots of this, some not. But, uh, uh, I think these uh, anarchist strains still exist all over the place, and you see them in all kinds of popular movements. In fact, you see them in every attack on hierarchic authoritarian structures, and there's plenty of those. I think the mic. Okay, I have the honor to ask the final question. Finally, um, first of all, thank you very much for being here and inspiring all of us. It's a great honor. My question was and still is: What is the most powerful method or way for humans to change the world to a more peaceful place without causing any harm? What is the key resource we as human beings have to do so? Well, I, th I, I, I don't think there's any general answer. I mean, it depends what you're trying to deal with. There are many problems in the world. There are different ways of 
uh, dealing with particular ones. Um, so to say uh, the treatment of Turks in Germany, which came up. Well, there are certain ways of dealing with that, and I think we all know what they are. No big secret. It's a matter of doing. Suppose you're concerned with uh, Fukushima, also came up. Okay, things to do about that. Uh, try to expand the German model to the rest of the world, but uh, we know how to do that. Uh, and just pick the case. And whatever the case may be, there are usually uh, pretty straightforward ways of dealing with it. There's not going to be, there's no general, so there's no magic key. You know, there's no magic key that can turn and solve all problems. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the difficulties with the, a lot of the uh, activist movements of young people, like 68, 1968, you could see right off that 1968 was going to collapse because there was a sense, which is kind of understandable if you're 20 years old, that if I do something, everything's going to be wonderful. So if we sit in on the, uh, the president's office at the Columbia University for three weeks, uh, there's going to be peace and love in the world. I mean, it doesn't work like that. It's a matter of concerted, dedicated, long-term activism, which over time can have effects. But uh, there's not going to be any instant gratification. And it's part of the, the problem of the... Uh, it, it, there are plenty of things wrong with the old communist parties. I don't have to go into that. But there was one thing right about them. They knew that it's a long-term process. You're going to have to be there all the time. Uh, this will be defeated, and you come back the next time. There were always people around who uh, maintained the tradition of... Uh, hard work and organizing. Back in the 1930s, there was some people who knew how to turn, you know, put out pamphlets, how you carry out organizing for the next stage. In fact, part of the, the fear of communist parties in the West was just that. They were too effective at organizing. Uh, I mentioned last night that uh, in Germany, for example, in the early post-war period, the United States uh, was dedicated to, as they put it, wall off Germany from the eastern zone. It's the term they use. And it's interesting to look at the reasons. The reasons were they felt that they could not compete with the left labor influences that were coming from the east at that time. So that, and they weren't able to compete with it, so they had to wall, wall the west off and then crush left and labor here um, in Germany and a lot of other places. It's mostly wiped out of history. I doubt if you read it in school. But that's what happened. You can find the scholarly work and the documents and so on. And it's precisely for that reason. And with all the flaws, terrors, and so on of the Communist parties, they did provide that cadre of committed uh, organizers and activists which just stayed there. They were ready for the next phase. Uh, the, uh, the As the kind of continuity of activist movements has been broken and each new stage comes along everyone starts in the beginning and they're very often uh, uh, driven by young people but the young people tend typically to expect something to happen fast we'll do something courageous and dangerous and it'll all be over and that doesn't happen uh, so we just have to learn the lessons from history as to what did work and there are many things that worked and there's no single answer but there are almost always specific answers so I, I don't think that the level of generality of your question can be an answer but if we look at particular cases I think there are things to do almost always Does academia work? Does academia work? It can I mean the universities actually in many ways are a lot freer than they were in the 19th 50s and 60s. There's long distance to go and there's also regression. But sure, there are things you can do in the universities. Actually, students in the university should understand that they are in the period of their lives when they're, they've reached the peak of any freedom they're going to have. They're free of parental control. They're typically not yet in the situation where they have to put food on the table for a family. So they got a lot of options. Uh, and in fact, uh, being at a university offers plenty of freedom. 
incomparable by most standards. So yes, there are things you can do at the university.